The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up. My heart was broken. Cancer on the kidneys and the lungs. It was devastating. And it was spreading. And that's worrisome, very worrisome. And there was no cure. Some people are dead in a few months. Why he turned down treatment. Instantly peace came upon me. And what saved his life. Which as I had, I spoke the word of God. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. At historic levels, the national debt is now on pace to exceed the size of our economy. When did that happen last? At the end of World War II. So what does it mean? The amount the United States owes will be greater than all the goods and services we produce in a year. Well, how did the country get in this mess? And is there a way out? Jenna Browder reports. The Congressional Budget Office says the federal debt is expected to reach or exceed 100 percent of the gross domestic product. The last time we saw this happen was back in 1946, after years of military spending to win World War II. The cause now, massive stimulus spending and reduced tax revenue in response to the coronavirus pandemic. The policymakers are proving roughly $2.7 trillion in spending since March. At the same time, federal revenue fell 10 percent from April through June compared to a year earlier. What's more, from March to June, the debt swelled by 16 percent, nearly $3 trillion. Economists say that stimulus was necessary to keep the economy afloat, and more is needed. Dr. Stephen Skanke is chief economic advisor at the wealth management and investment firm Keel Point. Right now, it's, uh, it's a boost that helps keep the economy recovering and certainly uh, keeps stock markets uh, soaring. But in the long term, it's harmful to economic growth. It tends to impede economic growth. Uh, the, the expected rate of annual economic growth will just be less. The gap expected to grow as Congress and the White House eye another round of stimulus. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin says he's willing to sit down with Congress and negotiate a new spending bill to help struggling families and businesses. But the price tag is an issue. House Democrats say they'll settle for a $2.2 trillion bailout, more than twice the amount of a Republican bill in the Senate. I do not support $2.2 trillion, but what's more important is what is the breakdown in getting money to American workers, American families, kids, where we can agree on money. Despite a struggling economy, the stock market is going strong, and positive news on the vaccine front Wednesday pushed it even higher. After the CDC notified states to be ready for a vaccine by November, the Dow closed over 29,000 points for the first time since February. The S&P and NASDAQ also hit new highs. The exploding national debt could have severe long-term consequences, turning the U.S. into a debtor nation. The debt dragging down the economy and affecting our standard of living, and possibly weakening other countries' perception of the dollar, eventually ending its role as the reserve currency of the world. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. I was reading today in the book of Deuteronomy, and I remember, of course, before reading that, that we had, under the administration of Harry Truman, we saw uh, Europe in devastation. And Truman felt so sorry for the suffering of these people. He said, let's do a, a plan where America can help them rebuild. And he said, they won't name it after the, me, because people don't like Truman. They think it's political. So we name it after Marshall, who's a hero. So it was called the Marshall Plan. And America loaned money and gave money <clears throat> in massive amounts to help people. We loaned money to many. We were the uh, arsenal of democracy, we called it. And uh, now we are losing our status as reserve currency. We are in desperate trouble. We have forsaken the Lord. And in Deuteronomy, it says this, and I think you ought to look at it. 28th chapter of, of the Deuteronomy, the alien who is among you shall rise higher and higher above you, and you shall come down lower and lower. He shall lend to you, but
but you shall not lend to him. He shall be the head, and you shall be the tail. Mm -hmm. And moreover, all these curses shall come upon you and pursue you and overtake you until you are destroy, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded you. And that you shall be upon you for a sign and a wonder on your descendants forever, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness for the abundance of everything. Therefore, you shall serve your enemies, whom the Lord will send against you in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, and in need of everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on you until he has destroyed you. Mm. You know, we have a curse upon us. This uh, pandemic is, uh, is destroying our economy. We shut our economy down, and uh, so many people are out of work. There are bread lines. People are suffering hunger. And this has happened to the most prosperous nation on the face of the earth. So just keep in mind, we need to turn to the Lord. I mean, if there was ever a time we should have fasting and prayer and crying out to God. Well, in other news, there's a dire warning from the Pentagon. The nation of China is growing its military, seeking to become an even greater superpower. John Jessup has more of that story. That's right, Pat. In a new report to Congress, the Defense Department warns of China's growing nuclear and naval power. The report notes China is expected to double its arsenal of nuclear warheads over the next 10 years. It's estimated the communist nation now has at least 200 warheads. The report says China also has the world's largest navy, with a battle force of around 350 ships and submarines, compared to the United States' battle force of just over 290. The U.S. Navy does have crucial advantages over the Chinese, including more aircraft carriers and, Pat, a network of about 80 naval bases around the world. Uh, you know, I was wondering about the uh, prevailing ethos, this driving G. You know, it used to be, it was called the Middle Kingdom. The Chinese were very peaceful. But when you go back in history, uh, they weren't necessarily peaceful. They, the, the Chinese were, but the Mongols above them were anything but peaceful. And this is the Mongol Empire. Look at that. This is where they used to, in 1279, they had all of China, all of Russia, the Ukraine, and Iran, and Baghdad. That was the Mongol Empire during Genghis Khan and then his grandson Kublai Khan. Now that's what was there. And this is the ethos. You ask, what is driving countries? Well, the Iranians believe in the 12th Imam, that he's going to come back. They call him the Mahdi. And when he comes, there's going to be devastation in the earth. Millions will be dying, and he will come and set everything straight. That's what they believe, so they don't mind killing a few million people with a nuclear bomb because the Mahdi is going to make it right. What does Erdogan believe? He believes that he's going to reestablish the caliphate that was at the height of the uh, uh, power under Muhammad, and he is going to be the caliph, and he's making every move in that direction that he will establish Turkey and, and his regime to reestablish the caliphate. He's making moving everyone in that direction. But what is the Chinese doing? They are trying to reestablish the empire of Genghis Khan. That's what they're doing. I want to show you that map again. You, you know, you say, what are they doing? This is what they're doing. That was under Genghis Khan. All the way, all of China, all of Russia, the Ukraine, and all of Iran, and, and most of the, the Middle East, at least that part of it. That's what they want to do, and that's what they're building toward. And if we get in the way, tough luck. I wonder how Putin feels about this. <laughs> well, Russia, Russia never had that kind of, you know, under Catherine the Great, it was, they sort of broke out of uh, barbarism. But Russia has never had that kind of expansive uh, uh, power, that they were under the control of Sweden and other nations. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, you know, Peter the Great, sort of taught them shipbuilding, and he went and lived in Holland for a while to teach them some technology. But Russia has never had that kind of authority. Uh, of course, the communists did under under the uh, Marxism, but uh, they've never had an empire like this. But he, he wants to do the same thing. <laughs> uh, just keep in mind, China is a terrible threat to us now. It didn't used to be.
but it sure is now, and that's what their goal is. They want to recreate the empire of Genghis and Kubla Khan. Mm -hmm. John? Pat, the president is directing the Office of Management and Budget to provide guidance on cutting federal dollars to cities that defund the police, highlighting Portland, Oregon, New York City, Seattle, and Washington, D.C. for review. The five-page memo also orders the Justice Department to identify and publicly list localities it defines as anarchist jurisdictions. The president tweeting Wednesday that his administration will do everything in its power to prevent weak mayors and lawless cities from taking federal dollars while they let anarchists harm people, burn buildings, and ruin lives and businesses. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo responded to the news saying, quote, the president can't have enough bodyguards to walk through New York City. He better have an army. Some called that a threat, but a spokesperson for the governor said it was not meant literally. New York City receives $7 billion annually in federal funds. This summer, the city shifted nearly $1 billion from its police budget. Crime is now soaring, surpassing 1,000 shootings in the city this past weekend, nearly double the amount this time last year, which represents an 89% increase. Well, now to that vaccine we told you about earlier. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is urging the nation's governors to get ready for a possible vaccine scene by November 1st. Director Dr. Robert Redfield writing in a letter to states that the government is, quote, rapidly making preparations for large-scale distribution of a vaccine in the fall. Critics fear the president is rushing a vaccine to get it out before the November 3rd election. NIH Director Francis Collins says it is unlikely there will be a vaccine in October, and the letter is simply an effort to help the governors be prepared when a vaccine does come. While some political analysts warn mail-in voting could cause a delay in determining who wins the presidential election, many Americans think results will come in fairly quickly. A new Axios poll finds 36 percent of American adults think we'll know who won the race for the White House on election night. 24% think it could take days to get accurate results, and 14% think it may take up to a week. Still 8% say they expect it to take more than a month to know whether Joe Biden or President Trump wins the election. And Pat, that is a nightmare scenario. Well, it's a nightmare, and they, they think if, if there's some kind of a tie and they don't decide it, it goes to the House of Representatives, and Nancy Pelosi could be the acting president. So you, you're looking at... Uh, Talking about a nightmare scenario, you're, you're, you've got it there. But I would urge people, I know I've been saying it looks like the violence is going to be a win for Trump, but it is absolutely imperative that everybody vote. Your vote is very important. Your vote counts. And, uh, you know, you're supposed to render to Caesar, Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. Well, what belongs to Caesar is, is active, intelligent citizenship. And uh, you, I urge everybody watching this program, be sure to vote. And if you can get a mail-in ballot, that's cool. But the polling places will be open. And regardless of what the weather is, you need to get your vote in. And I know you can hear somebody like me saying, well, it looks like uh, the violence is going to you know, give Trump the, the edge. Well, it is. But at the same time, uh, if you don't get out and vote, it doesn't matter what's on the polls. The last poll is the one that's taking on election day, not, not what you read about in the papers. John? And speaking of mail-in balloting and the, the difficulties with that process, the presidential election could face another major problem, foreign interference as other countries find ways to intervene. Gary Lane has that story. Attorney General William Barr first floated the idea about foreign election interference in a New York Times interview last June, saying it is a worrisome issue. Barr said, quote, There are a number of foreign countries that could easily make counterfeit ballots, put names on them, send them in, and it would be very hard to sort out what's happening. On CNN Wednesday, he went further, naming the country he believes is working hardest to disrupt our elections. Of those three countries that the intelligence community has pointed to, Russia, China, and Iran, which is the most assertive, the most aggressive in this area? I believe it's China. Which one? China. China more than Russia right now? Yes. Why do you say that? Because I've seen the intelligence. That's what I've concluded. President Trump raised similar concerns about Chinese and Russian mail-in ballot interference during an August 11th interview with Sean Hannity. Who knows who's getting them? The mailmen are going to get them, and uh, people are going to just grab batches of them. And you talk about China and Russia, they'll be grabbing plenty of them. 
It's a it's a disaster. It's a rigged election waiting to happen. Trump administration critics say foreign ballot tampering is highly unlikely because specific codes are used to identify ballots and ballot designs vary from state to state. That makes counterfeiting on a massive scale extremely difficult, if not impossible. Other methods of election meddling are more likely. Utah Senator Mitt Romney is concerned about domestic and foreign electronic vote hacking. There have been efforts to do so in the past. Uh, If that were successful, we would really have no way in some states to know what the right number was. China may pose the greatest threat. On August 7th, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence announced China does not want President Trump re-elected. And Beijing has been, quote, expanding its influence efforts ahead of November 2020 to shape the policy environment. China expert Gordon Chang says China could easily tamper with the election because much is currently done online. But what I focus on is what China has been doing to manipulate opinion. So, for instance, there have been these malicious disinformation campaigns about the coronavirus and about the George Floyd protests. But also China has got its troll farms operating. So we've got all of these fake accounts. In June, Twitter took down 174,000 fake Chinese accounts. Other social media platforms have done the same. So perhaps the easiest way for China or anyone else to sway the November election may come through propaganda and disinformation. That could pose the biggest threat to an uninformed American electorate now relying on social media as its main source of information. Gary Lane, CBN News. Thanks, Gary. Pat, a lot to look out for now just two months to Election Day. It's still going to be one of the most important elections in the history of this country, and people are woefully misinformed, and there's so much. You know, the president called it fake news, but there's so much out there. And now if the Chinese and the Russians are meddling with the news sources, uh, you know, keep your powder dry and keep your head on straight, Wendy. Remember back in 2000, how many weeks did we go without a, having a yeah, president? We, we were long, I can't remember, yeah. but it was it was a, it well, was a we, while. We were dealing with hanging chads and, and uh, you know, it finally went to the Supreme Court and it was just crazy. I mean, crazy. we didn't know who was elected. That, that was a nightmare, but pe- some people say it could be worse this oh, time. Oh, absolutely, Wendy. It's, it's going to be much worse mm. because there's so many, but all this mail-in, you know, they are just pouring ballots out. People, some are not on the roll, some are dead. You know, they, they still get ballots. and and it's crazy. Uh, or somebody could go to the mailbox and pick up a whole bunch of ballots and fill them out and drop them in the mail. I mean, it's, it's, it's a nightmare. And the president is, is absolutely right that this is a danger to our electoral system. Wendy? Well, still ahead, lungs covered with lesions and a deadly diagnosis of renal cancer. Why did this man refuse treatment? And what three words helped save his life? But first, making Aliyah during the pandemic, why do more and more Jews believe now is the time to come back to Israel? Find out after this. Lockdowns, travel bans, and quarantines. Israel has been cut off by the COVID-19 crisis. Yet more and more Jews keep flooding the Holy Land. Who are these immigrants? Where are they coming from? And how are they fulfilling Hebrew prophecy? Chris Mitchell reports on this historic era of Aliyah. Even during COVID-19, several thousand Jewish immigrants coming from Russia, Europe, North America, and Ethiopia have landed at Tel Aviv's David Ben-Gurion Airport. This is a very unusual and exciting season for us that these are people that many of them, they were planning to come to Israel, say, this summer so they could get their kids in school in the fall. And then COVID hit. They had quit their job and then they're in limbo. We call them rescue flights to bring these Jews here who are really stuck and can't go forward. For more than 30 years, the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem has helped more than 150,000 Jews to make Aliyah. 
It is fulfillment of God's covenant promises to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and it's fulfillment of the prophetic words from the prophets who were servants of those covenants and said, even though God is exiling you, he will come find you and bring you back. And so this is an exciting work that we believe has eternal value in that it will be here back in the land of Israel where God will pour out his spirit upon the Jewish people. One of the outcome of COVID-19 is that people are realizing that for the future, Israel is the best place to be. For 90 years, the Jewish agency has played a critical role in fostering Jewish immigration. When COVID-19 subsides, it expects a massive increase. We anticipate that in the next five years, there is a potential of 250,000 Olim that will come to Israel. And we need to work together with the government of Israel in order to build a special plan that will help them to make Aliyah. Nefesh Benefesh works with the Jewish agency to keep the immigration pipeline moving from North America to Israel. In June 2019, they had just over 5,000 calls for information. In June 2020, they had more than 25,000 calls. He showed me greater shakings coming on the United States, and he said that the Jewish people needed to be warned because their destiny was ultimately in Israel. Tom Hess says he wrote Let My People Go in 1987 after God warned him that one day the Jews in the U.S. would be safer in Israel. He just finished the 10th edition. The 15th chapter has to do with what happened in just this year, 2020, with all the things that happened with the pandemic and anti-Semitism and things that are happening in New York and all over the U.S. For the first time, probably since Israel was reborn, many Jews in the United States think that it's better to live in Israel than it is in the U.S. They used to think they can live there and they can bless Israel from afar. But now they believe that it's time to come back to Israel because I I think they see the ominous things that are happening. That now includes the frightening growth of anti-Semitism. Just seems this ancient hatred and animosity towards the Jews just doesn't want to die. And, and Jews are being blamed for COVID-19. It's totally absurd and outrageous. But if you're Jewish living out there among the Gentile nations and you're still getting falsely blamed for these things, no wonder many of them want to come home to safety in Israel. Parson sees Israel approaching a milestone nearly 3,000 years in the making. The Jews have actually been in exile since the Babylonian times. Even in the days of Jesus, more than half the Jews were still living abroad. This corona crisis could be the thing that pushes Israel over that threshold that more than half the Jews in the world are finally living back in the land. And this would be the first time since even the Babylonian exile 2,700 years ago that we could say the exile is is officially, formally, finally over. Whether it took a COVID crisis to do this or whatever, there's something about this moment we do feel is prophetic. Hess calls it a time to pray. I think the Christians should pray that God will open the gates of their cities, open the gates of their nations, that the Jewish people will be able to come back to Israel. May they come back sooner than later, because this is the year of Aliyah. This, I believe, is the appointed time for the Jews to come back from the West back to their homeland, Israel. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, that's what the Bible says, and I'll scatter you among the nations, but one day I'll bring you back. And I think you look at some of the signs of the end, I think the regathering of the Jews to Israel uh, is one of the key signs of maybe, maybe, maybe when the Lord is going to come back again, which is what we always look for. The Bible says, you know, even so come Lord Jesus. Wendy? That's right. He's coming back to Jerusalem, yeah. not to New York City. That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, this is the time for Christians to show the world that we support Israel and the Jewish people. And to help with that, we have a free booklet called, it's available, it's called Why Christians Stand with Israel. Uh, this is by Pat. And uh, to get your copy, call 1-800-700-7000 or visit cbn.com, Stand With Israel. All right, well, still ahead, informative, entertaining, and always unpredictable. Your questions, honest answers. Michaela says, I've had blasphemous thoughts and said some pretty horrible things to God. Have I committed the unpardonable sin? 
I don't want to go to hell. Hang on for Pat's answer coming up. But first, he was given 10 months to live with treatment. So why did this cancer patient refuse it? The miracle that stunned the doctors after this. First, a large tumor on his left kidney, then more bad news, both lungs covered in lesions. Greg Dublus was devastated by a diagnosis of kidney cancer. He was also desperate to live. So why did he refuse treatment? Take a look. To hear that I had cancer, or he told me cancer was devastated because I never had anything in my life. At 68 years old, Gregory Dublas couldn't remember ever being sick. But now doctors were telling him and his wife Athena they'd found a large tumor on his left kidney. They were certain it was cancerous. It was devastating. It was very, very hard, extremely hard. Doctors believed the best course of action was to remove the tumor along with his kidney and scheduled surgery. I began praying, believing God will take away the cancer, believing that the day when I'll go for the surgery, God will take away the, the tumor and I will be okay. I was praying about a healing. But prior to surgery, a CT scan showed more bad news. His lungs were covered with nodules, an indication the cancer had spread. My heart was broken. I was in such a condition that it's indescribable how I felt. I heard the Lord in crystal clear voice from the right side and told me, I know about it. Instantly peace came upon me. And by the grace of God, I forgot about this horrible feeling of being done, being devastated. Peace came, overwhelmed me. Doctors decided to go ahead with the scheduled surgery. A few weeks later, he was referred to oncologist Dr. Ted Logan about his lungs. Basically, we saw pulmonary nodules that were increasing in both size and number, and that's worrisome, very worrisome. I thought that that probably indicated that this was metastatic renal cancer. Dr. Logan explained the treatment options, including chemo, but those would only buy him time. None could provide a cure. There's a huge range how people do with metastatic kidney cancer. Some people are dead in a few months, and other people are alive years. So if you average it all together, it comes out around 10 to 12 months. Gregory remembers the drive home. I was brought so low as low as the dirt. I mean, it was devastated again. And I couldn't stop. Tears coming, water coming from my eyes. But then I heard the Lord tell me, cast it out, to cast out the spirit of grief and hopelessness. So as I was driving, I turned my head and I said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I'm casting you out of me. And instantly, this peace came upon me and the water stopped. <laughs> Once home, he shared the news with Athena. Fear came upon me, it did. And so when we were talking about it, he goes, I'm going to be okay, Athena. I'm going to be okay. Don't worry about it. That's, that's how he, he encouraged me. After considering the options and horrible side effects, they decided to forego treatment, well aware of the consequences. I have to say, untreated, most people are not gonna do very well. Gregory and Athena believe differently as they turn to prayer and God's word for healing. I assembled 70 verses of talking about hope, life, deliverance, and peace. Every chance I had, I spoke the word of God. John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, anything you shall ask should be done unto you. John 14, anything you ask in my name, I will do it. The Father be glorified. Anything you ask, I will do it. I belong to our prayer group. So there was so much encouragement, just belonging in that group, I had a lot of prayer warriors all over the place. A miracle began to happen. Inside, this faith that I already had began to rise to the point where I was expecting a healing. 
I was expecting to be healed, to heal good news. Then, two months later, he went back for blood tests and another CT scan. Dr. Logan had news. It was a surprising finding, but it's not something I haven't seen before. It's just very rare. The nodules in the lung, those shrunk. In fact, Gregory was told they were too small to be measured. Then I jumped up and said, I loud, I yelled loud. I yelled so loud, I know people heard me there, all the, all the doctor's office, Lord, thank you, I know you healed me. Medically, the phenomenon is called a spontaneous regression. For Athena and Gregory, it was the answer to their prayers. All those years that I knew what the Word of God was about became real. The healing and how God responds became real and how important it is for people to believe in the Lord with all your heart. That was 2016, and at each of his six-month checkups, there has been no sign of cancer. Gregory and Athena attribute the healing to the power of Jesus Christ. There's hope with the Lord Jesus. There is always hope. Pray to Him. Don't stop. Even though something might not have happened today, it doesn't mean that it won't down the road. He doesn't answer. That means that we need to learn to wait on Him. Every time when we believe in Jesus and we pray, the Lord hears. I love that story because Greg heard the word of the Lord. He was devastated, but then he heard that still small voice and it gave him so much peace. And then he heard the Lord again say, cast out that spirit of grief. And then he believed God for his healing. Well, God wants to heal you too. God is no respecter of persons. In fact, Psalm 103 says he forgives all of our sins and he heals all all of our diseases, not just some. So Pat and I want to pray for you, but first we've got some praise reports. Yeah. Here's one. Yeah. Uh, since December, Runette of Duluth, Minnesota, suffered from two serious health issues. One day she was watching the 700 Club when she heard you give a word of knowledge, Pat. Uh, you prayed someone dealing with an issue in their intestines, a blockage is being removed, you will feel much better. Then I had a word. Uh, you've got a problem with your hips, your hips and spine are out of line and you have pain coming up the small of your back, your spine will be healed, your hips aligned. Renette believed I am was instantly healed of both conditions. So fantastic. Double whammy there. You know, the Bible says if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you can ask what you will, it will be done unto you. He said, Without me you can do nothing. But he said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And so as we abide in Jesus and his word abides in us, then nothing is impossible. You can ask what you will, and it will be done unto you. Now, here's another answer. Rose, who lives in Williamsburg, Virginia, suffered from a severe allergic reaction, and treatments didn't help. She was watching our program on August the 5th when she heard Wendy say, someone you have an allergic reaction to something, a lot of swelling, redness, put your hand on your top of your head, God is touching you, and the poison is leaving. And Rose said, it's me. And Rose was healed instantly. <laughs> Praise God. I remember yeah, that right, word. Well, wow. Wendy and I are going to pray together. And listen, there's nothing impossible. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask what you will and it will be done unto you. The Lord is all powerful. And we're going to pray for you right now. Amen. Father, I join with Wendy and we pray. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We pray right now. Somebody's got extreme constipation. You just you don't know what to do, and and you, God is is just taking care of it right now. You just feel everything is going to be fine in Jesus' name. And uh, this, uh, I mentioned, I believe again that diverticulitis. Somebody has got that diverticulitis in your intestine. Uh, those um, lesions there. Uh, there's a complete healing right now. That the intestine is completely healed in Jesus' name, Wendy. There's someone, you were in such deep despair. You've just been through a series of losses, one thing after the other, and uh, you're just at the end of your rope. But God wants you to know that this season will end, and He's got joy, and He's got a, a future and a hope for you. So hold on, because um, God sees everything, and there is joy and hope in your future. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. And there's. Also, someone is it's almost yeah. like chronic indigestion. Yes. Uh, you've had it for a number of weeks now. The doctors can't figure it out, but God's touching you right now. Just put your hand on your stomach. You're being healed right now in Jesus. All right. Somebody's got something called dysplasia. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but 
God is healing it right now. You know it's you. And uh, yes, Lord. there's somebody named Norman. And uh, you have an obstruction in your throat. Norman, just reach up and touch your throat right now. And he, this obstruction is completely removed in Jesus' name. Now, Father, for others in this audience, they're praying, they're crying out to you. They have trouble in their family. They're afraid of the coronavirus. There's fear gripping them. And we cast out a spirit of fear, for fear has torment, and we deliver people. In the name of Jesus, the Word of God will set you free. Yes. And perfect love has those, uh, perfect love casts out fear, for fear has torment. You are free in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All Amen. right. Well, if okay. you've been touched, please let us know. And uh, we will love to talk about it right here. Well, still ahead is your prayer time on life support. No worries. Helps ahead. Crystal Evans Hurst shares her 28 day prayer journey coming up. And welcome back to Washington for this CBN Newsbreak. Mississippi voters will decide whether to accept a new state flag with a magnolia and the words, In God We Trust, on it. The old flag was retired because it included the Confederate battle emblem many view as racist. A state commission voted 8-1 to one in favor of the new design Wednesday. If voters accept it, it will become the new state flag. If not, the design process will begin again. Well, a wedding photo that was thought to be lost in California's Lightning Complex fire was found in perfect condition and returned to its owner. Cindy Whaley had to evacuate her home in Vacaville when wildfires threatened the area. During the hectic process, Whaley says a wedding photo of her parents fell out of her car. She hadn't even realized it was gone until one woman's Facebook post went viral looking for the photograph's owner. I don't believe there's coincidences. I think that was really God. Well, he says the photo was a gift from her late mother to remind her what matters most, and that's family and faith. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, have you prayed yet today? If not, you're missing out. To get close with God, you have to be intentional. And Crystal Evans Hurst has a plan to help you do just that. Crystal Evans Hurst is no stranger to best-selling books. It seems to run in the family, along with her dad, Pastor Tony Evans, and sister, author and actress Priscilla Shire. Crystal is eager to encourage the body of Christ. I believe that God can become more real to you than ever before as you spend intentional time with Him. The 28-Day Prayer Journey is Crystal's latest book, which explains how to have daily, raw, authentic conversations with God. And please welcome to the 700 Club, Crystal Evans Hurst. Crystal, great to see you. Hi, great to see you. Thanks for having me. Well, let me ask you, why do you think some people struggle so much with prayer, while for others it's almost like breathing? Well, I think um, having a conversation with someone you can't see in the natural is not something that might feel natural to some. And I think that prayer, just like everything else when it comes to our relationship with God, requires requires faith. You've got to do it, and then you experience the beauty of it later. Um, so some of us jump right in and others of us struggle to get started, but it's understandable. Crystal, why did you decide to come up with an intentional plan for prayer? And why did you choose 28 days? I'm very cur curious about that. Well, I needed it. And so <laughs> while I've never had a problem talking to God, I've never struggled with what to say, coming to God consistently um, wasn't necessarily a strong suit. And so I figured if I told um, folks, I was on Instagram at the time, that I'm going to pray for 28 days and I'm going to share prayers with you so that you can do it too. Just um, some community accountability would help me to do that. Just developing that habit of coming to God daily. And so that was um, why I decided to do it in 28 days, just because it's a close to a month that gave me a seven-day even format to delivering um, prayers in that manner. 
All right. Well, how do you how do you think some people limit their prayers, Crystal? Well, I think we limit God um, to what we will ask him for or what we will bring to him because either we don't want to be disappointed or we don't want him to really know what we really want, which is silly because (laughs) what we really want, what we really need, what we've really done, how we really feel, he already knows Mm -hmm. those things. And so why put forward the energy to hide when we're already known? Yeah, you talk about, oh, the Bible says that we should pray without ceasing. What does that look like in real life, though? Well, I think it's the idea of keeping an open line of communication. Anybody who's ever dated and felt totally in love knows that when you don't have anything to say, you'll still hold the phone. I remember um, in high school and in my 20s, you know, just being on the phone, on the phone on my way home, on the phone while I wash dishes. <laughs> On the phone phone while I was watching TV. And why was that? Was it because you were talking every second of that? No, it was because you just wanted to be on the line. And then when there was something to say, then you said it. And I think (laughs) praying without ceasing is not a specific thing to do. It is a principle of keeping an open line of communication throughout your day. Yeah, I'm flashing back to those three-hour phone calls, too, as well, where not much was said. (laughs) But, you know, how did prayer sustain you when your middle son suffered a birth injury? Well, I think that what I what I learned most from that is that, one, God does hear. He does answer. Sometimes it's in exactly the way that we'd like him to. Sometimes it's in ways that are um, outside of what we even expected. But if you come to God in faith, you do see that he does answer. My son had a birth injury. He was a shoulder dystocia baby and sustained some nerve damage. Um, while he does still have some physical limitations with that arm, there are so many things that I that I wanted for him mentally um, in his life, confidence and peace and strength that he does have in exorbitance. And there is there are so many ways where I can see that God has worked in his life uh, because of and in spite of that injury. Um, I remember praying hard for him um, in a variety of ways, and I've seen God answer. A mother's prayers are powerful. Well, Crystal, how did you organize your book? It's really interesting the way you included all types of prayer. Tell us about that. Well, I think that we typically come to God when we need something. And although we we should, I mean, he tells us to ask for our desires. He tells us to, to bring those things to him. There are so many other ways to engage with God. And again, going back to this concept of relationship, in my relationship with my husband or with a girlfriend, if the only thing I ever do is come to them to tell them what I want, that's not really balanced. It's not a balanced way to have relationship. Sometimes I should come to my husband or to a girlfriend and just say, I really appreciate you. Thanks for all of the things that you do, um, you know, around the house or in our friendship over the years. And if they have had, if we've had a situation where I've been offensive to them or I've hurt them, it would not be a balanced relationship if every now and then I didn't come to them and say, hey, you know what? I'm sorry. I know that this really hurt when I said this or this was offensive when I said that. And can you forgive me? It would not be a balanced relationship if I always had to have my way, my prescribed way. So every now and then I've got to be willing to say, hey, this is what I'd like, but however you'd like to work it out, I'll I'll go with it the way you want. And so when we think about our relationship with God as just that, a relationship, only coming to him for what we want, Mm. that's not the only way to be. So you come to God and you do give thanks and you do say, I'm sorry, and you do ask for what you'd like and you do surrender to his way being that his ways are higher than your own. And that's what brings balance. Amen. Wow, that's so good. And it's so true because uh, it's, uh, yeah, the balance. That's what he, God wants relationship with us. We're his kids. He wants to hang out with us and talk to us. So Crystal, thank you so much for writing this book. Um, It's called 28, The 28 Day Prayer Journey. It's available nationwide. God bless you and your family. Take care. Thank you. Well, coming up, a YouTube favorite. Your questions, honest answers. Loopy asks, how do you know if you're praying enough and if your relationship with God is lukewarm or not? See what Pat has to say about that and much more after this. Well, that was a time I'll never forget. Yeah, you don't forget when a vicious killer gives you a hug. Yeah, I mean, they said he was terrified everybody else in the prison, but the power of God was so strong, it was wonderful. I love it. And uh, I, I may add, the, the, the first printing of that book is sold out. There is an audio version with Kenneth uh, uh, 
Kevin Sorbo reading it. Okay. So if if you can't get the print, I, I hope the audio is still available. But if not, you know. Yeah, oh. a lot of people prefer the audio because they drive a lot. Yeah, and listen, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, yeah. I, we got Kevin to do it, and uh, uh, he, great actor with a great voice. Oh, a wonderful voice, and he loves the Lord. But anyhow, uh, you know, I guess the the printing will be up up in another few days. They'll have some more copies. I hope. Anyhow. Oh, absolutely, they will. We got it was it. fun. It's, it's been <laughs> fun writing it and fun hearing about it. Okay. All right, let's start with some email. We've got Michaela. She says, I've had blasphemous thoughts and said some pretty horrible things to God. Have I committed the unpardonable sin? Please help. I don't want to go to hell. Uh, I don't think you have. You know, uh, that's something that the devil often uses to tell you you've committed the unpardonable sin. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what he said to me. I had just come to the Lord, and uh, I was just rejoicing in God, and I was asleep on one Sunday afternoon, and these thoughts come to me, you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit, and you're going to hell. Wow. And, and you were a brand new Christian. Brand new Christian. And I, you, know, you know what I said? I said, all right, uh, if I'm going to hell, I'll go to hell praising God, because I still believe Jesus is the Son of God. And, uh, you left. You know, the unpardonable sin later, like it or not, is rejecting the Lord forever. That is the thing that cannot be forgiven. Okay. All right. Loopy says, Pat, can you explain what lukewarm means as it relates to the Bible? How do you know if you're praying enough and if your relationship with God is lukewarm or not? Good question. Well, you know, in Revelation it says, you know, you either be hot or cold, or I will spew you out of your mouth. Uh, if you drink uh, lukewarm water, you, you'll vomit. You know, it makes you throw up. And so Jesus said, it makes me sick in my stomach. But what's lukewarm? Or lukewarm is you're not really on fire for God. You're not really cold. You're just kind of fussy and along. And that's what so many so-called Christians do. Mm -hmm. They kind of go to church on Sunday, and the rest of the time, I mean, they just live their lives. You know, if you're going to be on fire for the Lord, I mean, it's daily. You, you need to pray every day. You need to read the Bible every day. You need to live in the Lord. And, he, you know, he said, you'll hear a voice and you're here saying, this is the way you walk ye in it. And if you walk with the Lord, miracles start to happen. All right? Yeah. And when bad things happen, like that story we saw earlier, yeah. you hear from God Amen. and he helps you through it. Amen. All right. Shirley says, I am loving your new book, Pat. Question, you wrote in your book that God told you that you made mistakes in New York and Boston. I'm confused. Doesn't the Bible say in Romans that God works all things together for good, including mistakes? Well, yes, he does. He teaches you mistakes, and you come to the Lord and say, Lord, I made them. I've screwed up my life. I'm sorry. Uh, you learn from that, too. But uh, uh, if you walk with God, you're not going to be a mistake-free. You, you won't. I mean, it's just... Yeah. You know, we learn, I, I learned, have learned more reading about the sins of guys like David and others in the Bible. You have, you have more instruction than hearing the guy was a perfect person and he lived a sinless life. Mm -hmm. All right, but I mean, I, yes, you make mistakes. I made mistakes. And the Lord said, you don't make mistakes in Israel. I'm going to go into Israel and this is the land of the Bible. And if you do something here, you may change prophecy so you don't make mistakes here, period, okay? Wow, that's, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> yeah. All right, Richie says, Pat, I'm an alcoholic and I've quit twice before. I don't know how to quit now. Please help me. Um, the thing about alcoholism, it's a, it is a type of disease. And Alcoholics Anonymous has, has found that if they can pair up somebody who's an alcoholic with somebody who's had a similar experience, that they can work together through this. I mean, you try to, everybody says, well, go cold turkey, and you start having DTs and so forth. Mm -hmm. Get somebody else. I mean, go to AA and let them see if they can't help you, but they can. But the Lord will forgive you, but just let him, I mean, the people who've worked with that, it's a great program for somebody who's a, who's a sincere alcoholic, and uh, the Lord will, will forgive you, and but you, you'll get over it when you get somebody who's walked day to day to day, who's accountable for you, and who'll give you when you have a bad day, you call and this guy's on the phone talking to you. Yeah. All right. Don't go it alone. Okay. Monica says, is it wrong or a sin to eat pork? 
I used to go to a church that would tell us that God states in the Old Testament that there are certain meats as well as fish that we are not to eat. How true is this? Well, in the Old Testament, you weren't supposed to eat the stuff that, that didn't chew the cud and have a split hoof and all that kind of stuff. I mean, let's face it, how many of you had bacon with your eggs for breakfast? I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with eating pork. Peter had a vision. You remember a sheet? Mm -hmm. and, and God, he said, I'm, I'm never eating stuff like that. And God said, don't call what I've made unclean because I'm making everything clean. So you're, you're free from the dietary laws of the Old Testament, but pork isn't necessarily good for you. I mean, you know, they have trichinosis and they don't cook it right. So <laughs> there was some real uh, wisdom in some of those dietary laws. So we leave you with today's power minute from the book of Isaiah. You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind on, is stayed on you because he trusts in you. For Wendy and all of us, Pat Robertson, see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.